guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Paradise Snare by A.C. Crispin. So this is a Star Wars book, it's actually book one in the Han Solo trilogy. I read this for Catless Reads Rereadathon, so I actually was planning on reading this in like November, I think. But basically one of the audiobooks that I was going to use, because... So for this rereadathon, because it's rereading, I'm using audiobooks, because I only ever listen to audiobooks if I've already read the book. So it seemed like the perfect way to do it. And I'm also listening to the audiobooks with Becca as well. But I was going to be reading an Enid Blyton audiobook this month. And basically the one I was going to use turned out to be all corrupted and stuff. And the only way I could then get another one was to pay like 20 quid or something. And it's only like three or four hours long. So I'm like, no. <laughs> So, I've switched around, so the, the theme for this month is a book that's a guilty pleasure, hence a Star Wars book, uh, instead of an Enid Blyton book, and then that means in November, when I was going to read this, I'm going to read I, Robot by Isaac Asimov, because the theme is a science fiction book. The problem with this, I guess, is that because this is part of the old expanded universe, basically when Disney bought Star Wars, they declared the expanded universe non-canon, and I'm pretty sure it was over a hundred books, all written by different authors, all kind of subtly interlinking and stuff to create this whole expanded universe around Star Wars. And uh, yeah, then Disney were just like, yeah, none of that happened. Which is really quite annoying when you've read probably over a dozen of these books. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I don't really care too much about the new Star Wars films that are coming out, because they're overwriting like my childhood memories of what I was told through the books was going to happen next and before and all of this stuff. So I really am quite annoyed that it all got declared non-canon. I don't know why they didn't just take the books and start making movies of the books, but no, apparently not. That little rant aside, I'm going to read you the blurb now. So before the Star Wars movies, before the titanic battles that freed the galaxy from the iron grip of the Empire, here is the never before told story of the young Han Solo. In book one of this exciting new trilogy, the famed rogue, con man, smuggler and thief struggles to survive on a sinister world where the chief export is slavery. He was a child without a past, a Karelian street urchin, abandoned, foraging for scraps of food, when the cruel garish Shrike whisked him away to a nomadic band of spacefaring criminals. Now, years later, chafing under Shrike's sadistic tyranny, driven by dreams of adventure and glory, Han fights his way free. His goal, to become an Imperial Navy pilot. But first he needs hands-on experience flying spacecraft, and for that he takes a job on the planet Ulessia, a steaming world of religious fanaticism, illicit drugs and alluring sensuality, where dreams are destroyed and escape is impossible. AC Crispin, her name is Anne Crispin I believe, she died recently unfortunately. I remember reading that she died, and uh, let me just Wikipedia her, because I haven't prepared this little bit of tidbit. Anne Carol Crispin, yeah, she died in sec September 2013. The author of 23 published novels, she wrote several Star Trek and Star Wars novelizations and created an original science fiction series called Starbridge. And yeah, she wasn't that old, so she was only 63. She was diagnosed with bladder cancer and she made an announcement that it had become terminal. She said, I want to thank you all for your good wishes and prayers. I fear my condition is deteriorating. I'm doing the best I can to be positive, but I probably don't have an awful lot of time left. I want you all to know that I am receiving excellent care and I'm surrounded by family and friends. And then she died three days later, which is very sad. The fact that she was a successful sci-fi writer at this time, you know, her career began in 1983. So... She was fighting against that prejudice that, you know, women shouldn't write sci-fi or whatever, which I think now we've kind of got over all of that bollocks. But at the time when she was first starting out, that would be something she had to fight against. So the fact that she had the opportunity to write a Star Wars novelization, to me kind of, and Star Trek as well, to me just kind of shows that she was considered to be at her best. You know, I'd fucking kill to... No, I wouldn't. And I wouldn't smuggle drugs. I wouldn't smuggle drugs. <laughs> to write a Star Wars novelization because I realized after saying I'd smuggle drugs to meet Stephen King that um, Yeah, smuggling drugs kills more people than if you just kill somebody so I would probably commit some sort of fraud to write a Star Wars novel, so now you know. I've rambled on for far too long about all of this, so I'm going to go into my actual thoughts of this. First off, I will talk about the audiobook, because the audiobook that I got, it was an abridged version, and I didn't, well, I kind of knew when I was getting into it because it was super short, but it's also the only, like, official version of it there is. There's no full-length audiobook. Fortunately, I have read this so many times as a kid. I mean, this is prob probably half a dozen to a dozen times I've read this, I reckon. And so, 
I already knew the storyline and remember the writing and all that kind of stuff, so I do still feel qualified to review it as this book, even though we only listened to the abridged version, but that was the best I could do, I'm afraid. What was cool is that it had all the sound effects and music and all of that kind of stuff, so it's kind of cool, for example, you'd have a fighting scene and the Star Wars music, the theme music will be playing, you got Wookiee roaring, maybe I've got some of this, let me see. Oh, it did have this high-pitched, like, buzzing sound with the audio, though, but... ...and fired the laser cannon again. The altar went up with a boom Han could hear from inside the talisman. So as you can see, he gets quite excited about it all. So yeah, so the only thing I would say is that because of that and the sound effects and the music, it was often actually difficult to hear what was going on. It was funny as well because to, to determine whether it was abridged or not, I obviously got my book out and was reading along with the audiobook. And basically, in all fairness, all they had done really was cut down on some of the descriptive parts. So it still kept all of the core stuff of it, if that makes sense. I was actually quite impressed with how they did it. They just took out some of the waffle, really. It was almost like it had just been edited, really. Really viciously. His Wookiee friend, he has a Wookiee friend at the start of the book and she just gets killed straight away. Which is quite sad. But also it was an interesting way of kind of foreshadowing his friendship with Chewbacca. We had then as well Garish Shrike. He was basically Space Fagan. Like, he, uh, yeah, he had a gang of kids, including Han, but Han wasn't the only one. There were loads of them. They were going around begging and picking pockets. Han actually was a beggar and he got annoyed because he wanted to pick pockets because it paid better. But it was just weird to see that parallel with Dickens, you know. He uh, he never knew whether he was abandoned by his parents or whether they died. He was just found wandering the streets of Corellia as a kid. Again, all of this is now no longer official though. So don't take my word for this and expect you're going to see this in a Star Wars movie. Because Disney fucked it. But anyway, right at the beginning, there's this really cool scene where he makes his getaway in the ship. And he crash lands on a planet. But basically he's running out of oxygen in the ship. And so, like... He's going down and it's about to crash and he's like, if I black out, if I hit my head and pass out, I'm going to die. I need to be awake long enough to open the door and hopefully there's a breathable atmosphere, you know. So it's actually very cool and very well written. It brought like a lot of tension to the scene. He had a fake name called Vic Drago, which to me just kept reminding me of Cal Drogo or whatever he's called from Game of Thrones. And then uh, there was Glitter Stim slash Spice. This is what was being kind of mined on this religious world. And again, that just made me think of Dune. So quite often this did feel derivative of other books. But having said that, I mean, it was great. If you're a Star Wars geek, you're going to love it, especially if you're a fan of Han. There are all kinds of little references. So, for example, at one point he goes to Alderaan and he sees Bea, Sen Senator Bail Organa with a child on his lap. And that child is obviously Leia. So that was kind of cool. I like the line when an, an urchin, I think that was on Alderaan, an urchin called him, called Han, you son of a diseased pervert. We have this great line of dialogue where Han goes, Tatooine, never heard of it. And someone's like, trust me, you don't want to go there, it's a dump. What also as well, which I only picked up on this reread of it, is that it's really damning of religion. It's actually, I would say, an anti-religion book. And what's interesting, I guess, about the fact that it's sci-fi as well, is that you do have this kind of eternal war between science and religion you see all over the place, you know. E even in some ways, like Dan Brown's books are kind of just about that war between science and religion. But I didn't notice how heavy this like criticism of religion was on my first read, but actually on this reread, I did notice it and I kind of enjoyed it as well. There are things as well that seem quite true. So for example, Han exposes to this, this girl, his love interest in it or whatever. He exposes her to the fact that this religion is totally fake and she's just like, now I have nothing. Like the religion was all she had. But at the same time, she went on this like pilgrimage and then they basically kind of kept her doped up with drugs and whatnot. And uh, in this religious fervor, and they just sort of tricked her while making her work to harvest all of this glitter stim. One thing I do think as well, because there's some like mind reading going on, it, I think it's the glitter stim, the drug allows people to read minds. And so she takes this mind reading drug and uses it to read Han's mind to see what he knows about this religion being fake. And she does all that, sees all that fine, but still doesn't realise that his name isn't Cal Drogo. Oh no, sorry, whatever his name actually was, Vic Draga, whatever. They don't realise, she doesn't realise that Han has a real name, even though she's kind of reading his mind. There was a point at which he got caught in a tractor beam and it was pulling him in. That was great. <laughs> what I did find as well, because of the truncation and the fact that he does have this love interest in this book, 
because the audiobook was only three hours long or whatever, suddenly it became insta-love. Like, he was meeting her parents and talking about marrying her and stuff within, like, an hour and a half or two hours or something. And that's not Anne Crispin's fault, really. I think that's just... It's a byproduct of shortening it for the audiobook, you know. But having said that, while Insta Love does tend to annoy me, I could overlook it for this. Again, because of the truncation, it was a bit weird. Everything happened too quick. I would say, if you're going to read this, definitely don't read the audiobook first. Read the physical book. Then maybe listen to the audiobook afterwards as well. You know, it's a bit. it did feel a bit like the difference between reading a book and watching the movie of that book or something like that. The, the truncated version didn't have everything. But again... Luckily, be be because I kind of remember it from, from back in the day. Han finally meets the parents of this girl. And they get really annoyed because they know that he uses aliases. And I'm like, at the end of the day, mate, he did rescue your daughter from a crazy religious cult that was drugging her and tricking her into becoming a literal slave. Sure, sometimes he goes around called Cal Drogo, but I mean, it's Cal Drogo. Everyone likes Cal Drogo. With my rating, I'm going to have... You're gonna, and you're going to have to bear this in mind as well that... My rating is kind of, it's informed by how I feel about this book and I have like a sense of nostalgia around it. So I'm going to give it a 3.5. I'm going to give the audio version, I'll give it a 3. I mean, it's still, if you're never going to read this, but you want to check out the audio version, I mean, why not, you know. But um, yeah, the, the full book obviously is better. I've never tried to review something that's truncated before because I was talking to Hannah Tay about this on one of her videos the other day because... I don't read abridged stuff, and the only reason I read this as an abridged audio book was because that was the only audio book. And the only time I've ever had abridged books before is when I've ordered the book and someone sent me an abridged version and then I've had to return it. But anyway, that's what I thought of The Paradise Snare by A.C. Crispin. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought. If not, let me know who your favourite Star Wars character is. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.